Lecture 9, Part 2 on Soil Water Unsaturated Zone Hydrology. The total energy of the groundwater at a location, the hydraulic head, can be determined in a pitometer. Water can only enter via the screen at the bottom of the pitometer. For measuring the hydraulic head, as shown to the left here, we can use a hollow weight, in Dutch, payload of plopper. Move the hollow weight up and down quickly. When it hits the water, it makes a plopping noise. From this, you can figure out the depth to the water and thus the hydraulic head. Alternatively, one may obtain a record of the fluctuations of the hydraulic head in a piezometer. See this figure to the right. One may install a pressure sensor T at the bottom of a piezometer as well as one higher up above the water level. The letter sensor A measures the air pressure. By subtracting the air pressure from the total pressure, water pressure plus air pressure, measured at the bottom of the piezometer, one obtains a precise estimate of only the water pressure. The letter pressure is linearly related to the length of the column of water and thus the hydraulic head. How do we measure the total energy in the unsaturated zone? Obviously, the total potential H of water in the unsaturated zone cannot be measured directly in the same manner as in the saturated zone. A pitometer above the water table will not contain water. The solution is that we measure the matrix potential Psi instead and deduce the total potential from this. The matrix potential is measured with the so-called tensiometer, in Dutch, tensiometer. This figure shows different tensiometers. Tensiometers consist of a porous cup, made up of plaster or ceramic, of 5 cm height or smaller, underneath a tube that is fully filled with distilled water. At the top of the tube, the water pressure is measured with a manometer, a pressure measuring device, usually a mercury manometer or a vacuum gauge. When buried in the soil, the tensiometer allows water to move freely through its porous cup walls between the soil and water filled system of the tensiometer. A tensiometer can be inserted vertically in the topsoil or, after digging a pit, horizontally at different depths. Care should be taken that the tensiometer is fitted tightly into the soil and that the tensiometer's porous cup is in good contact with the soil. The matrix potential can be determined after equilibrium has set in between the water in the tensiometer and the soil moisture. The time to initial equilibrium after placing a tensiometer depends on the soil type and the size of the tensiometer's porous cup. For heavy clays and a larger porous cup size, the time to initial equilibrium may be in the order of weeks. Therefore, it is advised to use tensiometers with a small permeable cup in such soils. The water pressure, Pc, at the level of the permeable cup C equals the sum of the water pressure, Pm, at the level of the manometer M plus the water pressure exerted by the column of water between C and M. The latter is rho G times delta Z. Dividing all pressures by rho G delivers the matrix potential Psi C at the porous cup as a length unit. The matrix potential Psi C then is the sum of Psi M, the potential measured at the manometer M, and delta Z. The difference in altitude. As a length unit, usually the centimeter is used. This figure shows a setup with two tensiometers where the matrix potential is measured at two different depths below the land surface. As an example, the manometer readings for both tensiometers psi m equal minus 110 centimeter. In the left tensiometer, psi m thus is minus 110 centimeter and delta z equals 60 plus 20 centimeter. The matrix potential at the porous cup 
psi c then equals minus 110 plus 80 is minus 30 centimeter. Now let us take the lens surface as reference level. With the porous cup of the left tensiometer located 60 centimeter below the surface, z at the porous cup thus equals minus 60 centimeter. And we can simply determine the total potential at the porous cup of the left tensiometer by applying Bernoulli's law. H, the total potential at C, equals minus 60 plus minus 30 is minus 90 centimeter. We can do the same for the right tensiometer. In the right tensiometer, psi m equals minus 110 centimeter, and delta z is 80 plus 20 is 100 centimeter. Thus, psi c equals minus 110 plus 100 is minus 10 centimeter. Now, the lens surface is the reference level. With the porous cup of the right tensiometer located 80 centimeter below the lens surface, z at the porous cup thus equals minus 80 centimeter, and we can simply determine the total potential at the porous cup by Bernoulli's law as minus 80 plus minus 10 equals minus 90 centimeter. For this example, the total potentials h at minus 60 and minus 80 centimeter are both minus 90 centimeter, so they are equal to each other. So we have no vertical water flow, hydrostatic equilibrium in between minus 60 and minus 80 centimeter depth. You may want to hold this video lecture just to study this at ease. Now let's change the left tensiometer reading psi m to equal minus 130 centimeter instead of minus 110 centimeter. The changes in our calculation then are given in yellow and green. The end result is that the total potential at the porous cup of the left tensiometer equals minus 110 centimeter, and that the total potential at the porous cup of the right tensiometer remains minus 90 centimeter. Minus 110 centimeter is a lower value than minus 90 centimeter. Water flows in the direction of the lower total potential, thus upward. And now let's change the right tensiometer reading psi m to be equal to minus 130 centimeter instead of minus 110 centimeter, which was the value for our original hydrostatic equilibrium, thus the no vertical water flow case. The changes in our calculation are again given in yellow and green. The end result is that the total potential at the porous cup of the right tensiometer equals minus 110 centimeter and that the total potential at the porous cup of the left tensiometer remains minus 90 centimeter. Minus 110 centimeter is a lower value than minus 90 centimeter. Water flows in the direction of the lower total potential, thus downward. When a dry soil is wetted, the added water will first of all be sucked into the smaller soil pores. One may visualize this as what happens when a dry filter paper, as analog of a soil, is placed upon a wet worktop. The water from the worktop will be sucked into the small pores of the dry filter paper. If, on the contrary, we would place a dry sponge on the worktop, a dry sponge consists of larger pores, no or hardly any water would be sucked into the sponge. Thus, small pores have a larger suction power than large pores, and this too holds for a soil. When water is added to a dry soil, the smaller pores will be the first to suck in the water at high suctions. And only after the soil has become quite wet will the larger pores start to fill at low suctions. 
When a wet soil drains, the water will first of all drain from the larger pores. One may visualize this as a wet sponge, as analog of a soil from which water readily drips. From a wet filter paper, hardly any water would drip, as the small pores of the filter paper hold on to the water tightly, that is, with a higher suction power, or, in other words, a more negative matrix potential. When water is drained from a wet soil, the larger pores will be the first to empty at low suctions, and only when the soil has become quite dry will the smaller pores, where the water is held at high suction, start losing water. Interestingly also, the maximum water content that a soil can hold against gravity is slightly and precisely defined as the field capacity, in Dutch, veldkapaciteit. When the soil becomes wetter than field capacity, surplus water will start to percolate, that is, drain towards the water table. The water content at which a wet dripping sponge would stop dripping provides a useful analogue for this field capacity. Field capacity, thus, is a lower moisture content than the moisture content at saturation, the porosity. One can reason from the water attracting and water holding properties of a soil in terms of suction, or from the pore water pressure in terms of a negative matrix potential. We may thus associate a high water attraction and holding on to the water with dry soils, small pores, water held at high suctions and large negative matrix potentials. And we may associate a low water attracting and holding on to the water, that is, the water drains easily with wet soils, large pores, water held at low suctions and a small negative number for the matrix potential. Here again we have the English and Dutch terms for the variables in Bernoulli's law in the unsaturated zone. For the matrix potential in Dutch matrix potential of Vochtspanning, we use the Greek letter psi. The matrix potential is a negative number. Suction in Dutch zuigspanning is the absolute value of the matrix potential. The suction thus is a positive number. As we use the Greek letter Psi for the matrix potential, we will use the symbol minus Psi for the suction. A low suction means a slightly negative matrix potential, a high suction indicates a strongly negative matrix potential. In the soil water zone, the centimeter is selected as the unit of water potential, thus for the total potential H, gravitational potential Z, matrix potential psi and suction minus psi. To avoid large numbers at high suctions, strongly negative matrix potentials, the PF has been introduced. The PF is the logarithm with base 10 of the suction minus psi in centimeter. Be aware values for the suction minus psi must be inserted in centimeter. As an example, under dry conditions, the matrix potential can be minus 10,000 centimeter. The suction then is 10,000 centimeter or 10 to the power 4. The PF then is log 10 to the power 4. The PF is 4. In my book, page 149 and box 4.1, the relation between the suction and diameter of a capillary pore is investigated by setting the force lifting a column of water in a perfectly shaped cylindrical capillary pore or holding it there in Newton equal to the weight of the column of water in that pore also in Newton, leading to this figure and equation. The figure shows the effect of different capillary micropore diameters ranging from small to large along the horizontal axis on the suction in centimeter presented along the vertical axis. 
The equation states the established relation between suction and pore diameter. Both show figure and equation. The smaller the pore, the larger is the suction. Measuring the matrix potential or suction with a tensiometer is not an easy task. The tensiometer's porous cup has to be well connected with the soil. No air may be entrapped in the system, and it's usually a very time consuming task. It is much easier and quicker to determine the volumetric moisture content and then determine the suction from this. Therefore, establishing the relationship between the suction and volumetric moisture content would come in most handy. Because the pore size distribution differs for different soils, and because different forces may be at work, as outlined earlier, the relation between suction and volumetric moisture content differs per soil type. A soil moisture characteristic, also named soil moisture retention curve or PF curve, is the relation between the suction, usually on the vertical axis, and the volumetric moisture content, usually on the horizontal axis. There are a number of ways to measure the moisture content in the field or from samples collected in the field. Graphimetric by oven drying, as explained earlier, or by a number of indirect methods using electrical resistance blocks, a Newton probe, gamma ray scanner, capacitance probe, time domain reflectometer, TDR, or frequency domain reflectometer, FDR. The suction is normally presented as PF, the logarithm base 10 of the suction in centimeter. All points on a soil moisture characteristic curve describe equilibrium situations between suction and moisture content. When determining the shape of a soil moisture characteristic, it may take quite some time to reach equilibrium. This figure shows the typical shapes of a soil moisture characteristic for a sand and clay soil. I will come back to these shortly. Let's first get a general idea on how a moisture characteristic is determined in the laboratory. Take a soil core sample in the field and seal it in such a way that moisture is well contained in the sample. In the laboratory, weigh the sample in its enveloping ring. This is to be able to determine the soil's volumetric moisture content at the time of sampling. As you already know, for this we need to oven dry the sample for 24 hours at 105 degrees Celsius. But we do that later, at the very end of our laboratory work. Place the sample on filter paper in a bucket filled at the bottom with water-saturated sand. Very gradually increase the level of the water in the bucket until the water is just below the top of the ring. This gradual increase may be spread over days for sands or weeks for heavy clays. By this method, care is taken that air is not entrapped in the soil sample. Weigh the water saturated soil sample in its enveloping ring. Note that the mass of water in the soil sample when saturated is taken to represent the mass of water at a pf of zero and not an unplottable pf of minus infinity at a pf value of zero the suction of course is 10 to the power zero or one centimeter which is near enough to saturation for our purpose here place the soil sample on filter paper on very fine sand in a sandbox as shown in this figure. Set the water table in the sandbox at a desired level, for instance at 10 cm below the center of the soil sample, as shown here in this figure. After hydrostatic equilibrium, no water flow has set in, which again may take days for sands or weeks for heavy clays. The matrix potential psi in the center of the soil sample equals minus 10 centimeter, which is equivalent to a PF of one. After equilibrium has set in, again, weigh the soil sample in its enveloping ring. Repeat these steps for different PF values. For instance, 
setting the simulated water table at minus 20 cm below the center of the soil sample means that the matrix potential psi in the center of the soil sample equals minus 20 cm, which is equivalent to a pf of 1.3. Psi equals minus 40 cm is equivalent to a pf of 1.6, and psi equals minus 100 cm to a pf of 2. Psi is minus 100 cm is about as far as one can go using fine sand in the sandbox. At the end, put the soil sample still in its enveloping ring for a period of 24 hours in a dry stove at a temperature of 105 degrees Celsius. After stove drying the sample this way, weigh both the sample in its enveloping ring and the core sample ring itself. We now have all data that we need to draw the soil moisture characteristic in between the values of PF0 and 2. Also, a number of other soil characteristics may be determined, such as the soil's volumetric moisture content at the time of sampling, the porosity, which simply equals the volumetric moisture content at saturation, and the soil's dry bulk density. For PF values of 2.0 to 2.7, a sandbox filled with kaolinite clay is used, whereas for PF values of 2.7 to 4.2, a membrane pressure apparatus is used. In the latter apparatus, loose samples collected in the field are used, instead of soil core samples. PF is 6, roughly equals the PF for a soil sample that is air dry. When we compare the shape of the soil moisture characteristics for a sand and clay soil, we notice, by comparing the curves along a vertical axis, that for the same volumetric moisture content, a higher suction exists in the clay soil, or that, when comparing the curves along a horizontal axis, for the same suction, a higher volumetric moisture content exists in the clay soil. This is due to the different nature of the water binding forces and because clay has a higher porosity and a larger variety of pore sizes than sand, especially well sorted sand. Many other curves could have been drawn in this figure for other textural classes, silt or gravel, etc., or soils, poorly sorted soils, well sorted soils. For instance, a curve for the silt textural class, which is intermediate in size between clay and sand, or for a loam soil, which largely consists of silt, would be found in an intermediate position to the sand and clay curve. When a saturated soil starts to drain, a certain critical suction must be exceeded for air to enter the largest pores, causing water to be released from these pores. This critical suction is called the air entry suction and may be visible as the length of a vertical line at the right hand side of the soil moisture characteristic curve as shown for sand in this figure. Because it's harder for air to enter a small pore than a large pore, the air entry suction is larger for soils with small pores, fine textured soils such as clays, than for soils with large pores, coarse textured soils such as sands. However, as coarse textured soils, especially when well sorted, have a predominant pore size, the phenomenon of air entry is more distinctly visible in the soil moisture characteristic curve of coarse textured soils, sands. Also, water held in these predominant pores will drain instantaneously with only a slight increase in suction as the soil dries out. The near horizontal part in the soil moisture characteristic for sand here is illustrative of such a sudden drop in moisture content with only a slight increase in suction. Field capacity has been defined earlier as the maximum water content or volumetric moisture content that a soil can hold against gravity. 
and the water content at which a wet sponge stops dripping provides an equally imprecise analog. The wilting point may be defined as the water content or volumetric moisture content at which a plant starts to wilt and die when a soil dries out or desiccates. The plant can then simply no longer extract water from the soil as the little soil moisture that is left in the soil is held there by too large a suction power. In practice, both field capacity and wilting point are taken as linked to certain PF values. For field capacity, usually the moisture content at a PF 2.0 is taken, whilst the moisture content at wilting point is generally taken at a PF of 4.2. This figure explains how to approximate the available soil water for plants from a soil moisture characteristic. Water held in the soil at suctions between PF is 0 and 2 percolates to the water table and is unavailable to plants. Water held at suctions larger than a PF of 4.2 is also unavailable to plants as just explained. Thus, the portion of soil water available for plants lies between the PF values of 2 and 4.2. Because of this, one may simply determine the available soil water for plants as a volume percentage by subtracting the volumetric moisture content at a PF of 4.2 from the volumetric moisture content at a PF. Two. Of course, plants subtract soil water with their roots. Therefore, the just mentioned difference in volumetric moisture content as a percentage can be interpreted as the amount of water in centimeter held by the soil if the root zone were 100 centimeter deep. Thus, as an example, if the percentage between the PF values of 2.0 and 4.2 would be equal to 20%, as is the case here, then a root zone of 40 cm depth would hold 40 divided by 100, thus 0 0.4 times 20 cm is 8 cm of soil moisture in the root zone. As we have become accustomed to, this 8 cm is to be regarded as a volume of water, in fact, a volume of water per surface area. The approximation method just explained is in fact a conservative estimate, because when a soil is wetter than field capacity, this extra water above field capacity is also available to the plants, but not for a long time as the water will percolate to the groundwater. Wilting point is usually taken at a PF of 4.2 and field capacity at a PF of 2.0. The latter, however, depends on the depth of the water table. Box 4.3 in my book explains how the PF value at field capacity is linked to the depth to the water table. When the water table is near the surface, as for instance in Dutch polders, it is better to use the volumetric moisture content at a PF of 1.7 as field capacity, as there is more water available near the water table. When the water table is located deep, it is better to use the volumetric moisture content at a PF of 2.3 as field capacity, as being further away from the water table, there is much less water available. When calculating the available soil water for plants, the volumetric moisture content at field capacity should then be taken at one of these PF values. The easiest way to determine the shape of a soil moisture characteristic is by starting with a saturated soil sample and then to determine the main drying boundary curve or main drainage curve as explained earlier. In reality, soils may dry out or drain, but after a dry period, the soil can of course also be wetted. 
for instance, by infiltration and percolation from rainfall. If we were to determine the soil moisture characteristic curve by starting at the dry end instead, and then determine the shape of the curve by wetting, of course, after waiting a sufficiently long time for equilibrium to set in for each established point on the curve, we would find a lower lying soil moisture characteristic curve as shown here. We call this curve the main wetting boundary curve or main imbibition curve. If we were to start at intermediate positions and dry or wet the soil sample, we would find intermediate drying or wetting scanning curves, some of which are shown here. Note that still all points on and in between the curves are equilibrium positions. This figure thus shows the equilibrium situation to be dependent upon the previous state and the process at hand, drying or wetting. The phenomenon of an equilibrium state being dependent on the history of the physical system is called hysteresis. In part explanations for hysteresis in the soil moisture characteristic are provided by the so-called ink bottle and contact angle effects, explained on pages 161 and 162 of my book. A full explanation, however, is provided after research by our faculty's emeritus hydrogeology professor Majid Hassanisade and others. In hydrological literature dealing with physical processes at the pore scale, the expression capillary pressure hysteresis is often used. This expression is synonymous to hysteresis of the soil moisture characteristic. The capillary pressure written as PC is equivalent to the suction. Also, the wetting phase saturation, SW, which is equivalent to the relative moisture content, is often used instead of the volumetric moisture content. The wetting phase saturation, SW, is that part of the porosity that is water saturated. Hysteresis of the soil moisture characteristic or capillary pressure hysteresis can be interpreted as due to only representing two variables and thereby missing out on at least one important additional variable which also significantly influences the relationship between suction and moisture content. In the figure here, the area of the air-water interface in the pores per volume of soil, AWN, is introduced. The figure is after Held and Celia, 2001. Rather than a set of boundary curves and intermediate scanning curves, this figure shows the relationship as a three-dimensional surface determined by the capillary pressure, wetting phase saturation, and air-water interfacial area. The soil moisture characteristic is shown as a projection of this three-dimensional surface on the horizontal plane. The three-dimensional surface was found to be a unique three-dimensional shape for an investigated porous medium or soil. The observed hysteresis in soil moisture characteristics can thus be fully explained by the missing out on this additional state variable of the air-water interfacial area per volume of soil. Unfortunately, it's not easy to determine this third variable as it requires much experimental work in a laboratory setting. In the next lecture, we will continue with the capillary fringe and with water flow in the unsaturated zone. First upward flow and then downward flow. Good luck with the exercises.